Welcome back to another edition of NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. For those tuning in for the first time, NCIA's Industry Essentials Webinar Series is our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs, all designed to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. I'm your host, Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events and Education here at NCIA, and I'm incredibly excited to welcome you all to today's highly anticipated webinar. In part four of our minor novel and synthetic cannabinoid series, we'll focus on shedding light on the occupational health and safety considerations necessary for manufacturing of cannabinoids. We'll explore the risk involved in this rapidly expanding field and provide you with valuable recommendations to mitigate these hazards effectively, as well as create a culture of safety holistically across your association. It is undeniable that the manufacturing of cannabinoids has become an integral part of our industry landscape. Over the past few years, we've witnessed a significant shift towards the production of plant-derived bulk ingredients in controlled laboratory environments, as well as through innovative methods like precision fermentation. With the continued emergence of cannabinoids, which do not occur naturally in plants or in quantities suitable for commercial extraction, laboratory-based manufacturing is set to play a pivotal role in the production of these compounds. Fortunately, we can draw upon existing regulations and occupational health and safety guidelines establishing for manufacturing novel ingredients used in both foods and non-food products. Throughout this webinar, we aim to achieve three primary learning objectives. First and foremost, we'll familiarize ourselves with the common occupational safety hazards associated with cannabinoid manufacturing, empowering you with valuable insights into how to mitigate these risks effectively, Secondly, we'll explore the distinct safety considerations that arise when working with naturally occurring cannabinoids, focusing on their isolation and purification processes, as well as the safety measures specific to laboratory synthesis of these cannabinoids. And finally, we'll emphasize the critical importance of understanding the unique safety considerations associated with various manufacturing processes, uh, such as hydrogenation and others. By comprehending these nuances, you and your team will be equipped with the knowledge to safeguard your business and mitigate potential liabilities. In today's increasingly complex regulatory environment, prioritizing occupational health and safety is paramount. By staying informed and adopting best practices, we can assure that the manufacturing of cannabinoids continues to thrive, all while safeguarding the well being of our workers and protecting the future of our industry. I urge you to engage actively throughout the session ask questions, participate in the dialogue, so that together we can delve into the realm of occupational health and safety considerations and cannabinoid ingredient manufacturing where knowledge is power and where we can pave the way for a safer and more prosperous future. All right, enough with this intro. Let's get this show on the road. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panel of industry experts to the stage, made up of members of NCIA's Cannabis Manufacturing Committee, Scientific Advisory Committee, and Hemp Committee, which have all been spearheading the development of this multi-part series over the last few months. So I'm going to stop my screen share here and turn it over to our panelists to give you all a little bit of understanding of their role in the, man, uh, the cannabis manufacturing landscape and their perspectives that they're hoping to bring to today's program. So with that, I'd like to welcome, let's just go in the order I see here on the screen. Rhiannon, why don't you um, give a little bit of background uh, to your expertise here and um, let the audience members know who you are and what you're gonna be talking about today. Sure, uh, my name is Rhiannon Wu. I'm the co-founder of Trace Trust. We are a um, audit standard here in the cannabis and hemp industry, uh, providing a quality management system um, audits Again, so how's your production methods? Do you follow a quality management system? How consistent are you in following that uh, process? So that's really my background is in quality management. And so obviously that touches very much on the product safety, but it's also the process safety to ensure that your process is being followed correctly time and time again to ensure the safety of your finished product, but also for the workers who are conducting that as you go. Fantastic. Perfect. Jacob, do you want to go next? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Jacob Enzlein. Uh, I'm, I'm working with my partner to cooperate AJ Cannabis Consulting. We're a two-man team and we do everything from application work through process train engineering to a product design. But I'm also an OSHA COSHO, that's a certified safety health official, and I'm a general industry outreach trainer. And I'm really excited to talk today about some of the 
unique hazards and hopefully different approaches that can be taken when dealing with a, what I would argue is a significantly more dangerous process of isomerization and, and general synthesis. Fantastic. Um, why don't we turn it over next to Keith, um, a dedicated member of NCI's Hemp Committee and previous panelists on these uh, multi-part program series as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Keith Butler. Um, I am the Chair Emeritus of the Hemp Committee for the NCIA. have been in the hemp industry since the 1980s. Um, I am dedicated to serving and as a steward of the plant. So I work in all aspects of the uh, of the hemp industry. I'm not really per se in the cannabis industry. Uh, I have multiple brands. I carry, uh, I'm a patent holder, both US and internationally for drug delivery methods. And um, I basically specialize in managing and operating a team of professionals within the hemp space on both the retail and wholesale at white label manufacturing side. And I just opened up a wonderful bar called Canna Buzz Bar in Lexington, Kentucky, where we're having our first infused THC meal with our two-star Michelin chef next weekend. So anyone oh. wants to go to that, drop in and <laughs> love to turn you on to a THC infused meal from a Michelin chef. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Keith, for your background, as well as some of that um, amazing upcoming activities that some of our network could engage in if they're uh, in the <laughs> Lexington area. Um, let's turn it over to Tanae Woodard of Kiva Brands to give you a little bit better understanding of her expertise and what she's going to be bringing to the program as well. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tanae Woodard. I'm the Director of Safety and Security for Kiva Brands, which is the manufacturing and distribution space. Uh, I've been in the safety industry for about seven years. I hold my ASP, Associate Safety Professional, um, distinction. I also am a member of Workplace Experience, which is about bringing education around the physical workspace. Um, I would also like to go and try the THC experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to hopefully that coming to California sometime soon. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tanae. Um, and then last but certainly not least, um, we have Tucker Holland, the Processing Director at Entourage Cannabis. So why don't you let the audience members know a little bit more about what Entourage has been doing um, as it relates to this issue, as well as your previous experience um, throughout the industry life cycle. Thanks, Brian. Yes, uh, I'm Tucker Holland. I'm the, the Processing Director and Co-Founder of Entourage Cannabis. Uh, we are a manufacturing company based out of Oregon. We were one of the first companies to receive our processing license within the adult use marketplace. Um, at that time, we had uh, four people working for us. We've grown to over 50 people. Um, right now, we're one of the top brands in Oregon, which is a very competitive market. And, uh, and we've done that with a, a focus on safety the whole time. Um, not just the safety uh, within our products to the consumer, but also the safety of our employees, making sure that when we are making our products, um, that we do it in a very safe way and uh, a long lasting way to make sure that we can continue operating within this space and, and keeping our people healthy. Yeah, fantastic. Well, really love that perspective. As, as some of the audience members would know, our part three specifically focused on um, health and safety implications for consumers in particular. So I think that's a really great perspective that you'll be bringing today's program focused more on the employee side of things during the manufacturing process as well. Um, so we've got a lot that we want to cover throughout the one hour. We're already a, a quarter of the way through. So let's just dive right into the first section that we had where we wanted to introduce some of the common occupational safety hazards associated with manufacturing cannabinoids um, and get everyone's perspective here. So I think we're going to kick it off by um, throwing it over to Jacob. Um, Jacob, can you compare and contrast the hazards associated with general extraction and post-processing as it relates to isomerization and synthesis in particular to help us frame the conversation uh, before we dive too deep. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way to start. Um, in, in extraction, I think we're generally used to dealing with maybe one primary extraction solvent that's probably flammable. I'm thinking of hydrocarbon extractors and ethanol extractors, but even if you're a CO2 extractor or you're just doing water and rosin or what have you, there's still some other hazards specifically associated with just your extraction process. Once you start getting into isomerization and, and synthesis, you really start tying multiple processes uh, 
together. Um, and while more of a dangerous thing might just seem obvious that it's more dangerous, like you have more flammable materials now, you have uh, you have more solvents, um, it's really unintuitive how the number of ways things can go wrong is compounding and just getting bigger and bigger. A lot of the accidents that a safety professional study are kind of like Rube Goldberg events where tons of things go wrong in series or even simultaneously. And like I said, it's really unintuitive to think about your liability when the number of very unlikely events is potentially getting very, very big. And a very big number of very unlikely events is still potentially a, bit, a big risk to you. And like I said, it's very hard to tangibly approach that in a way that's realistic um, without just being hypothetical. Um, and then, and, and so I would say that that's number one, the, the first thing. It's just more things is compounding the number of ways that things can go wrong. Number two, I would say is once you get into isomerization and synthesis, you're really looking for specific chemicals that have specific properties and, and, and activities. And unfortunately, some of these solvent and catalyst systems are potentially toxic or I'm thinking of the catalyst in particular, extremely reactive, talking about things that would react with water, the moisture in the air, the, the air itself, or maybe just light. Um, and so these, these, I think, would pose a particular uh, unique hazard that's, that, that's unique from what the rest of the cannabis industry is, is, is dealing with. Um, and then again, on top of that, the, the health risks and the, and the toxicity associated with those things, I think, are also uh, very, very unique to isomerization and, and synthesis. And then finally, the third major, ma major one, and again, these are just broad strokes, just kind of uh, ignoring the details. The, the third big one I would like to point out would be exothermic reactions, and in the sense that if you lose control of some of these processes, they could overheat to, to dangerous temperatures. Um, and again, I think that's a very unique hazard that the rest of the cannabis industry does just simply doesn't deal with at all. Um, yeah, awesome. yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for giving a, a little bit of a general overview there and sort of diving into the specific considerations that need to be taken into account with these unique processes. Um, let's turn it over to, to Keith and Tucker to get a little bit of a hands-on perspective since both of you all engage in the, the manufacture and production of finished cannabinoid products. Um, both of you all have been manufacturing finished cannabinoid products for many years. So what suggestions would you have to minimize occupational hazards in the final production stages of consumer products specifically? And I think Keith, you wanted to answer this one first. Sure. Um, so mainly when you're in a facility, the, the safety really comes down to the facility itself and the management of that facility, the, the designers of that facility, creating a safe workplace, creating safe. Uh, so you've got eye wash stations, you've got things for breathing apparatus, you've got eye protection, you've got hearing protection. All of these uh, objects and all of these safety tools are incredibly important. I used to snuff my nose at them until one day all this stuff went up my nose and I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced cannabinoids in the eyes, but they burn. Oh my goodness, they're awful. So it's and then the hearing. Um, we've got manufacturing equipment that is incredibly loud and makes all kinds of sounds, and it really can do damage to your ears. So just having a facility with those safety tools available. And then of course, good training on the equipment. So equipment can cut your fingers off. Uh, we've got so many dangerous pieces of equipment in our facility. If they were misused or mishandled, I would have no fingers or I would you know, have puncture wounds or cuts. Um, so it really comes down to a solid training and understanding of your environment as a manufacturer and then having the safety tools available to you when you walk into the facility of ear, eye, and breathing protection that is right there at the door before you walk in. And then, of course, having some type of mandatory requirement where when doing certain processes that you have no option other than to wear that hearing, eye, or breathing apparatus. Um, I know we all get a little loose sometimes in there, and every time I've gotten loose in a facility, I somehow end up bringing a bunch of stuff through my nose or into my mouth or into my eyes. 
And uh, every time I do it, I'm like, man, I wish I wore that mask. So that really is incredibly important. And uh, that comes down to the designers of the facility and the people who are managing the facility to have those tools available to the workers and good quality training. So I know Tucker's much more deep into the extraction. I'm more on the manufacturing side, but that's what we do on the on the manufacturing level for a finished product. Yeah, I mean, uh, Keith, I would definitely agree with you, um, especially on facility to design and and having a, uh, uh, your managers and people that know the processes. The one thing that we have found is is really understanding your process flow um, and especially how that grows with scale. So as you um, as you do one thing and you're doing it at this scale, when you move into another scale, you increase the volume or you're moving things more frequently. Um, you can run into issues uh, related to safety with those with those processes of scale. So um, I think that's a that's a very uh, critical thing that you need to be constantly reevaluating um, your your safety processes. Um, with your machinery, with your people, if you have two people in this room, but all of a sudden now you're moving three or four people into that room, does that change safety standards and what you need to do to, to teach your people? Um, and then making sure that you have, um, like you said, you have managers in place that are going to hold people accountable to following safety procedures. Um, it's no good if you, if you write a, a process or a procedure and you put that in place, but then you're not saying, no one's walking in and saying, hey, are you wearing your goggles? <laughs> you know, people, people hate wearing goggles. They just do. They, I mean, they, they fog up. They're, they're uncomfortable sometimes, but, um, but it's way more uncomfortable to, uh, to get something in your eye than it is to just wear those um, when you're supposed to be. So I think accountability is a huge thing, making sure you have the right people. Um, you know, especially if everyone's friends, you know, they hate holding each other accountable, but you have to do it uh, to be safe. So, um, and then, and then as you grow, reevaluating those, those processes um, to make sure that your safety is growing with your company, because um, that's an, that's a very important thing as well. Yeah, the scale thing's important. I've seen that firsthand, yeah. where one day we're making 10 kilos, and the next day we're making 100 kilos. Well, a hundred kilos can actually smash your feet and cause difficulties and injuries. And same with lifting and moving and getting the proper equipment to be able to move those sizes and volumes. So um, yeah. I've watched that's happened to us directly on this, on the scale part. And, uh, yeah. and, and Keith, you actually brought a blast uh, during our free, our other conversation uh, earlier, but um, even, even things um, glass in general is not, um, dangerous but broken glass is and so understanding what um you know if something does happen now there there's a new safety risk associated with with that we do use a lot of glass and and understanding how we store it how we clean it um uh you know even though the the, the beaker itself is not dangerous but if something happens to it now it can become um, dangerous and so being smart about that that's a simple example. I think everyone understands, but but there's uh you know those are other there's other things that are similar to that um, powders stuff like that. So yeah, thanks for remembering that. Yeah, the glass can be a real problem, and the powders especially if you got powders floating in the air, you have got to wear masks in order to cover. You get all kinds of things in your lungs that are not good for long term health. So. Yeah, as a as a former trimmer, I can say that you make that mistake of not touching your eyes once, and you never make it again. That's correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, perfect. Well, I think this I think this goes right into the next question that we had queued up for today. So thank you all for touching on a number of those different safety hazard considerations. Um, today, I know that Kiva has a foot in multiple markets across the country. So can you detail how these safety hazard considerations can vary from state to state? And specifically, are there any considerations which stand out to you as a prime example of a best practice to follow, no matter what your specific state regulations might entail? Yeah, there's a couple of things um, that comes to mind. So Kiva um, like licenses uh, their products. So across the different states, I personally don't have to regulate safety on the different states, but a really good uh, resource that I'll share here with the group um, as federal OSHA, you could check out if your whatever state you're in, uh, if they have a a state OSHA regulation as well as federal. So the way it kind of layers is you have your 
federal OSHA, you have to follow those guidelines. You have your state OSHA, you have to follow those guidelines. And then you have your company, whatever regulations that your company puts in on top of it. Um, and then if you're asking, well, which one do I follow? The answer is, well, the, the strictest regulation. Um, OSHA has this a really great catch haul, which is called the general du duty clause, which basically says you have to provide a safe work environment. Um, so a couple of things that I think that you should really kick it off with um, is you can look at an OSHA inspection sheet. You can get your hands on like Google OSHA, an OSHA inspection sheet and see what are the kind of things that they look for. Documentation. So all the things um, that Keith and Tucker have been, and Jacob are talking to, talking about when you're talking about having a mask, you're going to need to do, uh, you have to have an assessment. People need to get fit tested. There is a process. You don't just hand people masks, right? So make sure as you're going through all of these things, like uh, ear, ear hearing protection, and don't worry if you don't have a safety professional, you can actually have like your local clinic do all of these things for you. Um, so as you're putting in these processes, as you're assessing your hazards and risk, make sure you document, make sure you document the training, right? Make sure you keep all those records. If any of those things that Jacob was talking, those hazards Jacob was talking about uh, earlier, if somebody uh, comes up with something, an illness 10 years from now, you need to have documentation that you provided their, the proper protection. So document, um, training, an IIPP. Uh, most companies are supposed to have that if they're 10 employees or more. An emergency action plan. Um, those are another thing that uh, Jacob was talking about. We're talking about hazards. When we're talking about glass. Uh, you're talking about uh, something heating up and you have something shooting through your facility. You need to have a what, need, what if this when, you know, so those are kind of some key pieces to have within the facility just to get you started out with. Perfect. Yeah. And Rian, and I know that you wanted to sort of add some additional flavor to this. I think your perspective is very similar to today's here. So um, was there anything that you wanted to elaborate on as it re relates to specific safety considerations and, and making sure that you are following the strictest um, as the strictest ones as possible, just to make sure that you're covering all of your bases, no matter what your specific regulations might entail? Right. I mean, the other thing is really, and we can all obviously talk about this deeper into the webinar, is that the regulation is, even the strictest regulation is supposed to be the minimum threshold. Your facility has unique hazards and unique processes, which means you have to have unique responses to those hazards. So your facilities should exceed, you should always be exceeding those minimum regulations. If you say, oh, I meet this standard, unless you are only following the cookie cutter procedure that was thought of when that standard was written, you are not actually like, approaching safety with that safety first mindset. So I would definitely, I, we'll talk about this later, is understanding what's unique about your facility and making sure you're really addressing that. Perfect. Great. Awesome. Well, I think that that covered our first section um, well. If uh, any audience members have some additional questions or think that we might not have touched on a specific process in particular, use this opportunity to respond in the chat room or even better yet, post a question to the Q&A board so that we can dive deeper into it during the interactive Q&A section at the end or as a follow-up to today's program in a blog post. Um, so from here, we're going to transition into some specific recommendations for mitigating these risks. And I'm going to throw it right back to Jacob as well. Um, so I think this is in line with what we're talking about um, as a whole right now. But can you elaborate a little bit more on practices like quantitative hazard analysis and routine medical testing with occupational doctors to mitigate these risks that Tanae and Rihanna just elaborated on? Yes, yes. So... I mean, big picture, you need that culture of safety. And when and saying things like that, I think can sound kind of vague some some sometimes, but here, like one one big thing that I usually advocate with almost all of my clients, and the only time I wouldn't would be would be because they've already done it, is quantitative hazard analysis. So this would mean for every hazard in your facility, you you have a, a, a number for it. Um, and so for all the big ones, you you can measure them. And if, if you go online and go to like if you Google the OSHA field manual, you'll you'll find out how OSHA measures them. And it's highly recommend that you measure them the same way. There are companies that will rent you 
the equipment if you if you think it's too expensive to own some some uh i mean some of this stuff is pretty expensive the point is there's companies that that they'll rent you the the equipment you 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 need if you want to test your yourself this is called workplace sampling so all the atmospheric hazards all the vapors from all the flammable liquids you're dealing with anything all the dusts anything you're worried about your 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 people breathing all of those for sure have uh, sampling methods available and sampling equipment available, and your employees are most likely capable of performing these tests. If you don't trust them, you could totally hire a safety professional like any of us. And if you don't trust us, you could really go with a certified industrial high hygienist. A CIH would be the best way to go in terms of a workplace sampling. Um, whatever they test would stand up in court. They're 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 the best way to go. Um, it really just depends on what you think you're liability is and and what your 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 risk level is but those are just all the major ones i mean if, if you think to yourself hey this 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 might leak it's like okay well how how many gaskets do you have what's your length of piping for every possible happening you should be able to come up with a number that measures your 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 level of risk and once you have those numbers then you you can start figuring out what hazard controls are appropriate to deal with the numbers that you measured um, and that's how I would describe quantitative hazard analysis. Just it's a it's just a, a numbers based approach, and just by focusing on numbers, I feel like you can very successfully analyze like ninety nine percent of all hazards. Um, and then the uh, second one you have brought up, the uh, medical testing. This this would mean working with an occupational doctor. They're they're. An occupational medical practice is a unique medical practice. They understand the exemption, the, 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 the exemptions in, in the HIPAA laws and so on and so forth that allow you as the employer to send your, your employee to a doctor and then you, the employer, get the test results back. And so these the, these doctors will maintain confidentiality. They'll they'll maintain your trade secrets. You can tell them what you're worried about your employees being exposed to, and they'll come up with screening methods for them. And you can send them once, twice a year, again, however often you think is necessary. But at the end of the day, how else? Like if you're working with a toxic material, even if you have hazard controls in place, how else are you going to know those controls are working? unless you check the people who are potentially exposed. More, moreover, um, the, the, the overall cancer risk in the general population is like 40%. It's like four out of 10 people you hire are gonna get cancer eventually anyways. So how are you gonna prove it wasn't you? Especially if you're paying them to work with a cancer causing material. Um, but circling back to the culture of safety, um, if, if you don't have a strong culture of safety, doing the things that I just said probably sounds pretty ridiculous to you and like a lot of work. Um, it's that culture of safety is how you figure out from a business standpoint how those things make sense, how those things are easy, how every day it makes sense from a business standpoint for you to want to go out of the way to do those things. Um, that's that's where the culture of safety really comes into play. Yeah, love that. I, I really appreciate you diving into that side of it as well. Um, I think that this dovetails nicely into um, one of the things that might be preventing the ability to, to institute this culture of safety as it relates to some of these distillate compounds. Um, so I want to get Tanae and Rhiannon's um, insight on this side of things. Um, when we were in our prep session calls, we were talking about how um, receiving a uniform SDS or safety data sheet for individual distillate compounds at the moment is not common within the cannabis industry. Um, so can you explain the problem that this raises when attempting to mitigate risk or develop a comprehensive safety plan that Jacob just touched on? Yes. Um, so when you have a SDS or SDS sheet or safety data sheet, uh, it is a incredible helpful guide to let you know what hazards are associated with whatever ingredient that you're working with and let you know what your permissible exposure limits are uh, to kind of make that sound a little differently. Let you know how much things you can breathe, breathe in your nose, as Keith was saying, how much of that you can get in and what kind of damage at which levels uh, will happen. Right. And so when you don't have those safety data sheets explaining that. Um, then you don't know if I warm this ingredient up at whatever level from a manufacturing standpoint, 
what does that look like? If I'm touching it, as we're talking about like touching your eyes, uh, what kind of hazards? So that's a, a real challenge. Um, and to what we've been kind of discussing is um, then you need to make sure that you are then substituting it for ingredients that you do have safety, de had safety data sheets for um, or providing um, a PPE for the most, you know, for exposure to the skin if you don't know those things. Um, and just pause real quick. When we talk about providing PPE, that is the least that you can do to what Rihanna was saying earlier. You are expected to do more than just the least. So um, when there's like a hierarchy of controls, you could substitute, you, you know, engineer it out, administrative controls, all these other things you should do first before you provide those goggles that everybody hates or those gloves and now you have to monitor. Um, so those are kind of the challenges with, with not having an SDS sheet, as well as only, only going to just the lowest way of controlling those hazards. Yeah, and then like to piggyback on that, when you're not receiving a comprehensive SDS sheet, it is also letting you know that there's kind of some knowledge gap in your supply chain, because if the person, if the organization that you're purchasing this material from, whether it's a processing chemical, whether it's an ingredient um, that has chemical risk association, if they're not sending you this SDS, how are you trusting the overall quality and consistency of that incoming material? So it's starting to show you a story about the supply chain. And when you talk to them and you say, okay, well, you're doing a great job. Why aren't you able to provide me this documentation? And then come to find that their chemical supplier or their raw material supplier is falling down on the job. You have a responsibility, even as the final manufacturer, to be responsible for the whole supply chain back to like the base ingredient to ensure the safety all the way out to your finished customer and to your employees who are interacting with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and I, I think that that's something that we've identified during this multi-part series that seems to be a lack of a lack of information and a lack of standards across so many different elements as it relates to minor and novel and synthetic cannabinoids. I know that we touched on the in the last one from lab to label, talking about the interdependence of testing labs and how that relates to the labeling of these different products. And I think there's a gap in knowledge there as well, similar to this side of things. So um, I, I think that this is something that everybody needs to be aware of and try and stay on top of. Um, as it relates to that, um, both Keith and Tucker, I think you have a little bit of perspective on here, but specifically to Keith, first off, since you do operate under GMP and SQF standards, which can you explain first off what those are to anyone that might not be aware, um, but can you tell us what that means for workplace safety when manufacturing end user products under these regulatory systems? And then Tucker, just sort of an additional add on to that. What steps would you suggest as far as mitigating risks in an industry that is rapidly evolving at the moment, such as the cannabis industry? So I'll throw it over to you first, Keith. Sure. So uh, GMP basically means good manufacturing processes, and SQF means uh, safe quality foods. So the SQF system was set up by Walmart in order to ensure that Walmart's vendors uh, were consistent across the board on a global level. So if you want to be a vendor to them, you've got to be an SQF facility. Uh, we're an SQF2, which means we're also uh, covered for allergens. So if you're putting peanuts or dairy or all those types of things, they, they have certain procedures which have to be followed in order to not contaminate products that are downline from the products you just manufactured or cross-contaminate for people with allergy, allergy problems. The Mainly the GMP and the SQF standards are about consumer safety for a finished product. And that's really about the SQF is a higher level. SQF requires that the, any supplier is at minimum GMP in order to bring the products in. And really what it does is it sets a set of safety standards for manufacturing that ensures that nothing gets contaminated. And if it does, that there is a procedure in which to mitigate those uh, the damages or injury caused by that. So um, realistically, that's what all of those certifications are about is protecting the end consumer, not so much the worker, which would fall more into the OSHA guidelines as opposed to the GMP. Um, and on the safety data sheets, we provide those safety data sheets with our products. Uh, I think it's imperative that the SDSs are out there and very rarely do I ever see it coming in from a manufacturer, no matter what it is. So uh, 
the higher level you get on manufacturing, the more you're, you you start playing with those levels, like of, of having an SDS sheet and having that knowledge. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and as such an established sort of leader in this space, specifically in Oregon, Tucker, um, what would be some of your suggestions on how to stay in front of these different uh, mitigation techniques and sort of um, keep up to speed with the cannabis industry that seems to be evolving each and every day? Definitely. Um, well, uh, I'll kind of bounce to what Jacob had mentioned about uh, safety being expensive and some of the things that you have to do are expensive. Uh, but what is more expensive is an accident or someone getting hurt. Um, and so uh, recognizing that um, that by being proactive about safety, you're actually mitigating uh, costs in the long run. And, um, and, and and it only takes an accident or two for you to really, truly understand that. And so um, for one, being proactive, what we did specifically for our company that was huge for us um was um was we actually hire i mean we have a safety officer someone who's in charge of employee safety within our facility um and then we also have a uh, a gentleman who is in charge of of maintenance of equipment and those two things have really actually um truly truly um left us forward within our safety um, I know when you when you look at that, um, you know, the first, well, I can't afford to have a safety officer or something. We actually tied our safety officer within our compliance section in our um, uh, our state compliance of cannabis. So um, the lady that handles our, our metric, our compliance, and is in charge of all that, she also is now in charge of, um, of uh, just our safety in general. So how we looked at it is keep us in compliance of everything. We need to be compliant within the movement of cannabis and we need to be compliant within our safety of our employees and everything that we do. Um, and so um, she she takes a look at that stuff all the time. She's in, she's within, she offices out of our facility um, and she's constantly speaking with our employees. And that's kind of the next big thing is you have to have a culture of openness with your employees that we care about your safety and and we need feedback. It doesn't, it doesn't, if you just go and talk to your people, you'll find out real quick that there's some things that probably need to be changed because the people that are working on things constantly, if you just ask them a lot of times, they'll be like, well, yeah, maybe we should change that. That doesn't seem very safe when I'm doing it. Or, or maybe we should do this. They have a lot of ideas if you just speak to them and have a culture of, of openness about that. And so um, how we, you know, I, we say a culture of safety leads to a culture of excellence. So we want great products. And, um, and, and if we have high standards within our, pro, uh, our company of products, we better have high standards in our company with safety. Um, and so, and then the last thing is a lot of times safety is multi-layered. So, um, and that kind of goes to, um, um, what we were saying about, um, um, doing the bare minimum, if you have multi-layered safety nets, um, not just wearing goggles, um, but um, uh, you know having the eye wash station there as well, even though they're wearing goggles, like having multi-layered safety nets um, is going to create a, a better layer of safety and and lead to fewer accidents within that, and that's specific to each case. Yeah, fantastic. I I love seeing so many heads nodding amongst this panel. Um, I think that today is just eating up what you're saying, Tucker, specifically about safety. Safety is, it exemplifies excellence. Um, and I know that we have a few questions that are going to dive a little bit more into creating that culture of safety um, in a more holistic manner. But before we dive into that section in particular, I did want to throw it um, back over to Jacob so that we can touch on some specific safety considerations as it relates to some of these unique production processes that we have been touching on um, for minor novel or synthetic cannabinoids. Um, as a cue into that question, um, none of us here are exact experts on some of these uh, specific processes ourselves. Um, however, we've been working with a multi-committee collaborative group um, of people that engage in all of these. So um, did want to sort of touch on um, some of those specific safety considerations. Um, and Jacob, would you be able to say what are the key differences in these occupational safety considerations uh, between isolating and purifying naturally occurring cannabinoids versus manufacturing or synthesizing cannabinoids in the lab? Yeah, yeah. So 
I would say that that goes uh, back to what I was saying about the the exothermic reactions in the sense that going from cultivation to extraction through most post-processing methods, whether you're doing like vape pens or gummies or a topical or, you know, a pill or and almost, I, I, I can't think of off the top of my head any other process in the cannabis industry that's using exothermic reactions. So once you start getting into isomerization and synthesizing, you're kind of in a whole new world of dealing with the thermal dynamics of, of, of your reactions. Um, and then there's also, like I said, the toxicity of these things involved in the sense that um, you have a lot fewer choices like in, in extraction and purification or let's just focus on, on on purification if you're running a chromatography process like the uh, dusts are pretty hazardous um, but you have a lot of choices of what dust to use and some might work better than others and some might you know be easier to keep out of the air than others and so on and so forth. But once you move into isomerization and synthesis, you're really looking for chemicals that have specific action and that action is gonna be related to the hazard. And so, I mean, as I really wanna bring up the hierarchy of hazard controls, which I think Tanae mentioned, and the first thing's elimination. So, I mean, if, if you can just eliminate the dangerous process in general, that's really the best way to make money. But I mean, knowing that we're not gonna do that, the second best thing would be substitution, right? So when you're looking at the solvent catalyst systems, trying to substitute for one that would be safer or easier to control these these big picture questions. I mean, like like Tucker was was what was saying, it's not worth building a facility to do this if it's just going to be destroyed and you're not going to make any money anyways, um, right? So like these these are major considerations to you know think about. Okay, just because this one goes faster or this one has higher yield or 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 what have you, you know, like can we handle it? Can um, what's going to happen two years from now, five years from now, 10, 10 years from now, if we get all this equipment and just use it over and over again to do this? Um, yeah, so I, I would say uh, the, 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 the major differences once you move over into the, the isomerization and, and, and synthesizing are, are the chemistry related hazards. But again, it's just a big, a big picture approach. Every facility is unique and right, the, 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 the Right, you really have to focus on, on uh, yeah, doing the job hazard analysis, both in terms of the process and from the process perspective and the employee per 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 per, per perspective. Just really recognizing all the hazards that you're dealing with. Um, yeah, fantastic. I think that's a fantastic transition into the final section that we wanted to relate and um, sort of I love the interaction that's going on here in the chat room. Thank you, Jen, for providing your perspective as well and how you um, go about incorporating and incentivizing a culture of safety amongst your employees. Um, love seeing some of the panelists say that they love that idea as well. So similar to that, um, if any of you all have specific safety considerations that you might have implemented into your production processes as it relates to isomerization, hydrogenation, purification, or synthesization, um, feel free to post them in the chat room so that other people can piggyback off that as well. Um, but like I said, I think this leads right into our final section of creating a culture of safety holistically. Um, we spoke uh, amongst the panel, we spoke a lot about the parable of teaching a man to fish it relates, as it relates to this creating a culture of safety across your organization. So sort of piggybacking off of um, Jacob's remark there, um, would either uh, Rhiannon or Tanay um, give us a little bit more understanding about how you would go about conducting a specific hazard analysis for these risks across your production processes, um, and maybe also detail how to develop a risk analysis matrix um, and how that can uh, factor into the development of your overall safety program. Um, I could start. So when we talk about having a risk analysis, I think what everybody's been saying is really important. You need to have the people who are actually interacting with those hazards in the room. So if you have employees that are interacting or managers that are acting, when we conduct risk analysis, we make sure to do interviews with them, right? Ask them, um, you know, how are you, uh, and how are you interacting with the, the hazard and the risk? And again, your hazard is something like um, the ingredient that you're using or the heat and the risk is inhalation. It could be, you know, the risk is um, uh, touching and burns. Those are type of, you know, hazards and risks. So um, when you sit down with your team, 
and go over what are our hazards, what are our risks. It's really important to have all your safety professional there, your employees there, or at least interview your employees, your safety manager there, your uh, maintenance person, like Tucker said, um, having a maintenance person is really key keeping your equipment up because they'll be able to help uh, talk about what kind of risks are associated with your hazards. And then um, my favorite part is the risk matrix, right? So then you look at like the severity and um, likelihood, right? So on one, your X, X is severity, Y is your likelihood or vice versa. And then as you get into those highly severe, highly likely, then you know to put your money, your time, your energy towards those injuries. And then as you look at something, let's say, Maybe a cut is a hazard and it's really, really not really likely because you guys wear gloves all the time, um, then it's going to be lower. So that really helps direct how you're spending your energy and your money. And then the one thing I really wanted to just talk, to talk about is we're talking about, you know, what happens if you ignore these processes is um, really, frankly, you can shut your facility down if there's an injury that is dramatic enough if OSHA is coming in there and they see that these are not there's no processes in place um the the risk is great not just from a good standpoint you know keeping your, in, uh, your employees safe which is very important but just the the the, the longevity longevity of your company Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think to, or, piggy, go ahead, Rihanna. I think to piggyback on that too, Tanae, um, is once you invite those frontline workers into that hazard analysis process, that actually kicks off the culture of safety because they have buy-in. They're like, these people listen to me. When I say this is dangerous, it shows up on the whiteboard. It makes it into the binder. So then the next time they see something that's dangerous, They'll go to the safety offer and say, like, hey, this wasn't in existence last year when we had the meeting, but this exists now. Can we add that to the binder? So, like, bringing them in as early on the process actually gets them involved, like, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, that buy-in is is absolutely essential, as all of us have really touched on. So whatever you can do to incentivize that and keep people and playing an active role in the development of that from the get-go, from the moment they enter into the doors at your facility, I think is, is absolutely imperative. Um, so I know we're coming up close to the end of the hour. We've had some amazing uh, interaction on the Q&A board. So first off, thank you all to the audience members for posting those great questions. And then also thank you to the panelists for going above and beyond while you're delivering your remarks live and addressing these questions. This is one of the things I love about the webinars so much is that the ability to have this interactivity um, while we're actually presenting a program um, is so much more uh, is so much more engaging than if we were actually you know at a conference behind a table trying to think of doing this while we're doing the panel um, would be impossible. So thank you all so much for the interaction here. Um, I think we're gonna um, try and tie this all together. We've been touching on the benefits of the culture of safety as it relates to employee safety um, specifically and how you can mitigate your liability and risk. Um, but I know as Tucker mentioned earlier, some of the, and, and Jacob did as well, is if you're not actively engaged in this culture of safety from the get-go, trying to think that implementing this um, you know, halfway through is going to be such an uh, such an enormous cost to you, and will entail you having to reconfigure so many um, so many elements of your business plan. But I know that a number of us touched on this during the prep session that there's a number of key benefits and specific areas where cost savings can occur if you implement these protocols. Um, so I think today you have um, some really good insights here, but everybody else feel free to jump onto this as well. Um, can you elaborate on some of those cost saving benefits um, that can um, come to your business if you take this uh, understanding a little bit more holistically? Sure, um, so there are, uh, the direct cost of like, let's talk about your workers' comp premium. Um, workers' comp premium has like a, a like threshold of like one one percent or a hundred percent, and there's always like some give there. So there's nobody who's at like zero. So when you're talking about your multiplier or your X mod, a huge uh, portion of that is your is your uh, past three years experience three to four years experience um, of your injuries, uh, of your of your claims for your workers' comp. So uh, for instance, uh, and at Kiva, we've been able to year over year decrease 
our XMOD for about by about 10% and saved almost a million dollars in the last three years alone. So it's just like a direct cost you can put like into your into your people, into your equipment, into your company by the money that you're saving. And then um, another cost savings would be uh, uh, the injuries and the time. So if there's somebody who's injured, now that person's gone, everybody's picking up the slack. So of course there's the morale, but now your manager is managing an employee who is not working uh, their regular their regular jobs because they're picking up slack or the injured employees coming back under accommodations. And again, that person's not doing uh, what their regular job is. So there's a cost to the loss of the times uh, the, the days uh, the person is on accommodation is, or out of the facility. So those are kind of the top two uh, off the top of my head that I could think of as far as like what kind of costs are associated with a, a healthy, safe program. Nope, oh, Keith, you're muted, but feel free to jump oh, in. Great. I would love to throw something out on that. So yeah. we really want to save some costs. Let's uh, slow down on the isomerization and the synthesizing of cannabinoids. It's dangerous processes using dangerous chemicals, and there's really no need for it because the plant provides everything we need in its natural state. So uh, I personally, uh, I, I can't believe all of the work and effort people go to create new intoxicating components so they can get around the law. Just use the plant for what it is and uh, enjoy what nature has to give us. Love it. I see you nodding your head there, Tucker. Did you want to elaborate on that as well? Yeah, for one, I, I would agree with Keith on that, but I would also say uh, today we've actually experienced that exact same thing, you know, as far as a, a reduced uh, premium um, uh, due to the, the safety and, 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 and actually seeing that on the bill come down, you know, is, 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 a, is a fun thing, you know, that, that does actually get you a little excited about um, about safety, you know, when you actually are seeing a direct uh, cost savings through it. Um, and then worker uh, worker attendance, you know, people um, being healthy. And I think that's the one thing that maybe we haven't quite uh, touched on, but um, the other is is actually just the health and wellness of people, you know, and promoting a, a, a healthy culture as well. So, um, you know, we've even seen people that if you don't have uh, just comfortable chairs, you know, if they're sitting and working, they sit hunched over all day, you know, having great chairs for them, um, they, they work longer, they work more efficient, um, and they come back to work, <laughs> you know, because it's comfortable if they're standing, having mats for them. Um, and those aren't necessarily things that are always considered within safety. Um, but it is a health and wellness thing that over time, um, can actually lead to better performance and cost savings within that. So, um, you know, I think we've, we've looked at that as uh, and, and dragging it within the, the safety is, is just the health and wellness of our people and making sure um, that we're trying to do things that promote a comfortable environment, not just a safe environment, because uh, we, we hold on to your people and they work better. Yeah, I mean, to piggyback off of that, what Tucker's talking about here is like a lot of my focus is you've created this great program, but do your people actually follow it? And one of the things that I do is like, look at, you have this great process. Everyone agrees that it's the right way to do it, but they're still not doing it and why. And so like the one that I come up with all the time is the most clear example is hand washing compliance. Like we just came through COVID. Everybody's been hammering hand washing compliance, not just from a product safety, but also like a worker safety, keep everybody healthy and coming back to work every day is very reliant on good hand washing. But the number one cause of low compliance on hand washing is that they can't choose the temperature of the water. So because they don't have the ability to change the temperature of the water, they don't want to wash their hands for 20 seconds so that no one gets COVID. And if we just give them the ability to choose the temperature of the water, all of a sudden hand washing compliance shoots way up. So like it's it's great. Everyone agreed. Yes, we should all wash our hands so no one gets COVID. So when I'm standing here at this thing, why is everybody just like kind of splashing their fingers under the water and not washing? Oh, because it's too hot. It's too cold. Like they're all little Goldilocks trying to find the just right water. Well, once you give them the just right water, boom, everyone washes their hands. And then people say, okay, well, now that we have clean hands, let's also like wipe all these surfaces. And then all of a sudden <laughs> that compliance level just like shoots way up. Illness levels go way down. 
Yeah, couldn't agree more. I think that that ties so much into that teaching a man to fish parable that we sort of um, identified as a way to sort of frame this final um, section of the program specifically. <laughs> um, and and to today's point, I, I'm glad that you touched on that. We had a, one of my favorite webinars that we produced about a year and a half ago was specifically on the ergonomics of trimming and sort of the the safeties and, and ways that you can avoid musculoskeletal injuries. It was fascinating. I I've always go back and rewatch that one just to see some of the, the interesting elements that we incorporated in there. Um, but I know that we're at the end of the hour. Um, I know that you, Tanae, specifically are abroad right now. You're um, uh, joining us from Spain. So um, you have a hard stop. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your uh, vacation um, to join us and present uh, this amazing program. So I think we want to just um, specifically transition into our usual final thought segment turning it over to each panelist in turn to give that sort of key takeaway that you want all the audience members to, to leave co today's conversation with. So today I'll kick it off with you so that you can jump if you need to, and then we'll go just in turn around the panel and then we'll close it out. Um, okay, so this I really enjoyed this time. Thank you all for um, partnering so we can bring um, the safety message to everyone. Um, I will put in um, ways that you can contact me into the message for everyone. Um, I think my favorite my favorite thing about safety is one of the key elements of the IIPP is responsibility. And the key is, is that it's everybody's responsibility, right? Um, our, your safety professional isn't gonna be everywhere all the time. So because we all wanna go back home to what we love and a healthy uh, body that we went to work in, that we just all should embrace safety and safe practices and buy in for, for our own health. So that's the one thing if, if that I could leave you with is remember that safety is all of our responsibility. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Tanae. If you have to drop, feel free to, to jump off. I really appreciate your perspective throughout today's program, as well as the prep sessions leading into today's call, and look forward to working with you more to, um, to create this culture of safety amongst NCIA's membership network at, 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 at large. Um, yeah. So um, perfect. Uh, so with that, um, did anybody want to jump right on to today's comments in particular, or do you want me to just go round robin across the, the panel to get everyone else's perspective? Let's do round robin. All right, perfect. So I saw you, Tucker. So why don't you close it out um, with your final thought and your key takeaway um, for all the audience members today? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, especially if you, if you look at safety and it seems a little overwhelming, start small start small, start doing the little things right, um, and build off of little successes. Um, I think that's a, a, a um, kind of a key point in entre uh, entrepreneurialism anyways. Um, but um, if something seems big, find, find the little things first, uh, get some successes under your, um, under your belt and, um, and start there. But, um, but other than that, um, make it a priority. Um, safety has to be a priority. It is a priority. Um, you will appreciate yourself so much more in the long run if you make it a priority um, and start small. Awesome. Perfect. I think that was a great way to tie that all together as well. So why don't we go to uh, Rihanna next, or Rihanna. I, I swear one day I'm going to get okay. the actual pronunciation <laughs> of your name correct. <laughs> No, it, it's totally fine. I answered to pretty much everything. Um, yeah, no, I think one of the things that, like from my point of view, I see a lot of great plans written and I see a lot of uh, frontline employees agreeing that it's a great plan and where there's kind of like a, a gap is that they are not doing it for whatever reason. So I think that's just gonna be my follow-up is that you have to really keep the frontline workers engaged with their own safety. And, and when they, when their compliance lowers, really understand why are they not doing what they even agree. They agree that this is what they should be doing, so why not? And sometimes it's really easy fixes, like they want to have the adjustable hot water temperature in the sinks. Sometimes like the, the they're the wrong height for the trimming table. And if they just had like a little platform to stand on, they would be great. So like really just continuing to ask them especially when you see non-compliance, it's not just punitive, like, hey, I'm gonna write you up and I'm gonna give you um, a write-up in your file how you were non-compliant, but like, why are you non-compliant? And is there something that we can make it easier to do the right thing? And that's like the biggest thing, you get really great compliance when it's easy to do the right thing. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You got to make it easy. You got to get that buy-in and you have to incentivize them across the board to participate in that and become the advocates for themselves and for their coworkers um, at the, at the organization. Um, so Keith, why don't we get your perspective as well on that? Um, your final thought that you want to leave everyone with, from today's audience with. Oh, and you're muted. Uh, sorry about that. To me, no safety has a, has a lot of aspects to it. And while we focus primarily in, in the manufacturing side of keeping our employees safe and not causing injury inside the facility, I think even more important is producing a product that goes out to the public that is yeah. safe. And that's where I pull back on the isomerization and the synthesize and blah, 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 because there are no safety profiles associated with any of the products that we're creating in laboratories today whereas the natural plant itself has a millennia of uh, safety data to go with it. So I'm a big proponent of creating safe products that when consumed have no adverse drug reactions. So um, we, we provide products and, and services in, in that realm. And, and I think it's incredibly important that the end product is safe as well, besides the manufacturing facility where it's made at, that the employees don't get hurt, that the end consumer does not get hurt by what we manufacture. So yeah, exactly. Couldn't agree more. And, and I really appreciated your perspective that you brought to part three of this series, specifically focusing on just that. So I would definitely encourage anyone if that resonates with you as well, and you might not have you might have missed part three, follow the links that I'm about to drop here inside the chat room um, so that you can learn more about all these amazing programs that have been building on top of themselves leading into part five that we'll be showcasing later this month. Um, and then finally, uh, Jacob, you really helped us frame today's conversation um, and made sure that we touched on all the different elements and learning objectives that we wanted to hit. So is there a key takeaway that you want to provide to the audience um, as we leave today's program? Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I would really want to hammer in hazard analysis and the hierarchy of hazard control. If you're going to do a new process, um, like a lot of this stuff should be buy once, cry once kind of deal and at the end of the day doing safety right like like going all out on all the most elaborate safety stuff would be a small fraction of your overall cost if you were to consider the cost of doing this from 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 scratch or even from halfway through i mean big 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 picture it's a hard argument to make that it's too expensive um so yeah just really hammer in if you're doing something new hazard analysis find out all the different ways that you can measure what's going on measure it and just have that information and 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 then use it and know that if you're relying on ppe you're probably making a mistake right like really follow the hierarchy of hazard controls just analyze them control them oh love that i think that was the perfect way to close out today's conversation so um, once again, thank you all so much um, to our panel, as well as our audience members that stayed so actively engaged throughout today's program. Um, like I've been posting inside of the chat room, um, this is part four of a multi-part series that is going to finally be culminating with part five, specifically focused on regulatory recommendations later uh, this month. Um, if you have any questions on how you can contribute to that conversation in particular, don't hesitate to reach out to myself following today's program. We'd love all of your all's immediate feedback in the live poll that we just shared. And then stay on the lookout for a post-event email to come out within about 48 hours. It will include a link to a formatted video recording of today's session so that you can share this amongst your team and go about actively creating that culture of safety and starting that process. Um, from the beginning. And then also we'll have links to the previous sessions so you can get up to speed on all of those. And finally, that login or that registration link for the final session that's going to be the culmination of this amazing series. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for participating in another Industry Essentials Educational Webinars. Our panelists are going to leave the virtual stage and we're going to close things out as we always do with this end of event member appreciation credit sequence. Um, this specifically is going to focus on the 40 or so uh, sponsors that we have secured for our next annual uh, Cannabis Industry Lobby Days taking place next May. If you want to learn more about how you can take an active role in the association 
head to NCIA's website to learn about all the amazing opportunities to join the association. Um, and then learn you can learn more about how you can support these individual efforts in particular through sponsorship or contributions to our committees or all the other various platforms that we provide to promote um, best practices and educational efforts across the industry. So thank you all so much for participating in another Industry Essentials educational webinar. I look forward to hopefully seeing all of you all on part five later this month, tentatively scheduled for July 26th, and stay on the lookout for some amazing guest speakers that we're going to be inviting and adding to that program over the coming weeks. And with that, thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.